I was thinking as we were singing that song, I guess just coupled with having just heard from uh, Brother uh, Wilson, the Jews can't sing that, right? The, if we would use the term Orthodox Jew, they don't have an empty tomb and a risen Messiah, um, and, and yet they do. They have access to that, and I just was struck by that. What a, we just take for granted the hope we have as believers and um, so many sincere Jews who do not realize he has already come. And he's coming back again, right? And they will look upon him whom they've pierced and all that goes with that. So grateful we have access to that, that truth. Daniel chapter 10 tonight. And I hope our series, just because we're um, a week and a half removed from the election, I think I mentioned to you when we began this series that uh, part of the motivation was just my own cathartic trying to get my own head and, and heart where it needs to be in relation to this season that we are in. And uh, we will finish. This will be our last chapter. Next Sunday night, as I mentioned, we'll be talking about election intelligence and just how we should view elections through the lens and prism of Scripture. Um, and so I hope tonight we'll kind of set the table for your, your thoughts and your emotions these next few days. Daniel chapter 10, let's begin in verse 4. This is a shorter chapter, so we will hopefully get to read each of the verses in the chapter, <coughs> but uh, at least these couple of verses to start with. Daniel chapter 10, let's begin in verse number 4. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great uh, river, which is Hidekel, then I lifted up mine eyes, verse 5, and looked and beheld a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the barrel, his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. So you keep hearing, it's just Daniel trying to help us get our eyes and heart and head around what he's seeing with his best attempt at describing it with the Lord's help. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, <laughs> Daniel alone saw the vision for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, verse 8, I was left alone, Daniel says, and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face <laughs> toward the ground." So we're looking at the um, aspect of he reigns a steadying study in Daniel of God's rule in our present world. Um, and Daniel models for us how we're to respond to those truths. And tonight, a little bit of an interesting study. We're going to talk about this, that God reigns through his messengers. Um, I believe that there is a lot of angelic activity and reference in Daniel chapter 10, um, and obviously, our relationship with God, with the complete canon of Scripture, is a bit different than maybe it was in Daniel's day. But God sends to us his message and his messengers, and we would do well to heed his message. That's how we let him reign um, in our lives. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. Lord, thank you <coughs> for your goodness. Thank you for the day we've enjoyed together, how you truly met with us um, this morning, and uh, as we've even contemplated what you've done already today and in preparation for tonight, we thank you for your goodness. We don't deserve for you to meet with us. We don't deserve to have access to your word. Um, we don't deserve to have your spirit illuminate it and uh, change us in the process. We don't deserve to know, as we just mentioned, that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is the soon-to-return king and sovereign and Father, I pray that you would help us to heed the message that you've given us in Daniel 10 tonight, that through that action of submission, that you would reign um, in our lives as we listen to, as we heed, and as we submit to what you have revealed to us. Bless this study. Be honored in it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Um, I don't know if you remember back to your childhood days <laughs> some of the cartoons you would watch. Some of you, you're, you're before TV, okay? I don't know, maybe we don't have any of those left in our ranks, but um, it's funny to me how the wholesome cartoons that I watch now feel so violent. Um, and now and then I'll see a little clip of one, I'm like, what in the world? Especially like, I'm thinking like uh, 
Roadrunner with Wild E. Coyote, where they keep blowing each other up and then come back to life again. And some of the, as a kid, I'm watching things with like TNT on it and explosives and, and just, and we're so panicky and breathless about things our kids are exposed to today. Um, but one of the things I remember in the cartoons, I, th- I think this is Disney, Disney's deep theology. You remember the good angel and the bad angel on the shoulders? And I can't remember, I would assume probably the right side at least politically, I would like to think this. The right side is the good angel. The left side is the evil angel. Well, the other day, um, I, I didn't even see this. We take pictures on Sundays at the church. And this is a, I'm going to see if you can catch it. All right, so I'm just going to show it to you. This is a picture after church of a bunch of our guys. So just, you see Jonah and Gabe, and I think Micah is there with his head turned. George is just amazed at Micah, whatever he's saying to him. You got Gavin and Abel. Do you see somebody on Abel's shoulder? It's his left shoulder, by the way, okay? So Micah can run with this. It's Titus. Do you see his mouth? He's like just messing with everybody. Uh, Saturday, I was on outreach, and I had the privilege of going door-to-door with uh, Micah and (laughs) Titus. And Titus just has a, um, it's a dry sense of humor but he has a sense of timing that's just hilarious. <laughs> so we were kind of joking him about that. Um, but <laughs> what I bring that up is his mouth, right? You see his mouth. Can I say to you this evening, so much, listen, so much of the present and the future is shaped by whose mouth we're listening to. Like, it's amazing how many people are trying to get our attention. I really think today, the economy of our day is driven by eyeballs. They're trying to monetize your attention. That is, social media is not to give you wholesome little thoughts from Scripture. It's not meant to give you recipes for amazing things you've never eaten before. Their goal is to keep you on there as long as they can and to allow different <laughs> messages and uh, mantras to be fed to you. And so we must make sure we listen to um, the right messages. Most of us in this room, I just want to challenge you with this initial thought, starting with me, need to be more selective in the mouths we're listening to. It's amazing to me, I start listening to somebody and then, "Eh, that wasn't so solid, and I like their personality, I like kind of their profile, I like some of what they present, and what happens is you can get worn down, right, by influencers and YouTubers and political pundits and news programming and cable news, all the stuff that we all have bombarding us all the time, and we must be (laughs) more (laughs) selective and focused in the messaging that we listen to. A friend of mine who's in ministry was talking about, um, because messaging is not just diatribes and lectures and preachers, one of, I think, the most most, um, subtle forms of this is in our music. Um, And he said this, he said, the greatest anthems of this world sung by its most popular artist articulate from humanity a desire to be loved, to be accepted, and to have a good life. Yet in the end, every one of them points to self, money, or sexual fulfillment as the greatest hope to satisfaction for the heart of mankind. Generation after generation, the world's stars sing to us about our longing for these things and all the styles and genres that we demand, and yet they, quote, have still not found what they are looking for. So we've got to be more selective in the messaging that we allow into our homes, our hearts, and our minds, and Daniel 10 admonishes us to listen to the Lord. Now, <coughs> I will say this in Daniel 10, because we're going to get <coughs> to kind of an interesting section of it. In Daniel 10, God pulls back the curtain for us to see an aspect of spiritual warfare that has never been pulled back before. Um, And so I'll just whet your appetite with that. But God reveals some things in Daniel chapter 10 um, that prior to this we had not known. And so we'll get to that in just a moment. And if God knows more than anybody else, then probably he's the one we should be mostly listening to. So here's kind of the overview of 10 through the end of the book. All right, Daniel 10, 1, <coughs> excuse me, through chapter 11, verse 1, is the introduction to this final vision. The vision is given to us in chapter 11, verse 2, through chapter 12, verse 3. And then <laughs> the book of Daniel ends in uh, Daniel 12, 4 through verse 13 with God's instructions with what Daniel's to do with this vision. So Daniel 10 to 12 is a 
it all rises and falls together. It all fits together and complements one another. And so we will end at the end of chapter 10 and pick up next time in a few weeks in chapter 11. <coughs> so the question is this as we begin tonight. In a day of even God's people getting distracted by lesser voices, how do we give our full attention, undivided attention, to God's message? Let's talk about tonight two types of messengers or messages, characteristics of what God is revealing that should hone us in on. That's God saying that. That's not man's thinking. That is God's. All right, so let's talk about those two things. Number one, allow God to reign through visionary messengers. Whatever God reveals to us always has a fresh sense of vision. Um, I, I love history. Man, I love history. I don't know if I'm into smoking meats or World War II. We talked about this this morning as you, as, as you age. But I would guess that World War II will at least be a part of my future. I, I already enjoy studying aspects of history. But <coughs> our God, listen, is always leaning forward. So we have to be very careful to not allow, and here's what I see because of especially our types of churches, if we're not careful, we can get stuck in the past or letting the past overweight, be overweighted of how we're viewing things as they move forward. There is no reason, brethren, for us this evening to be scared of the future. There's no reason for us to be intimidated by the future because God is already there. He's already written the end of the story and he's trying to reveal to us a sense of vision. Don't you love that Brother Wilson, at his stage of life, his wife has navigated for years chronic issues health-wise. He's investing in the next generation. What I, what I was struck by in that video, he's still got a vision. Because he's listening to God. He's not listening to the pundits. He's not listening to the prognosticators that are doom and gloom. He has a view of the. He even talked about the ballistic missiles. He's like, it's exciting. Why? Because he has a vision of the future that God has revealed to us in his word. And we need to return to that um, in our day. So allow God to reign through visionary messengers. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you've had this battle. I have, especially with, I mean, I've been in this mode right now of hacking and coughing, trying to figure out what I have for almost a month now. I think I had pneumonia, took some antibiotics this last week. Still not sure all of what was and is. But anyway, <laughs> the, the temperature like how I look at the forecast in the morning, low of 33, high of 78. Like how in the world do you dress for that, okay? I don't know of any outfit. Cody's got a, a, a turtleneck on this evening or today. Like, okay, I could wear that at 9 a.m., but at noon I'm going to be sweating bullets, okay? Uh, how do I plan for um, the future? God <laughs> gives to us uh, <laughs> that vision and that anticipation. Jot this down if you're taking notes tonight. <coughs> Without surrender to God's message, we can never access God's vision. Without surrender to God's message, we can never access God's vision. What I have found with God's word is before I can see what God wants me to see in it and through it, I have to first submit myself to it. And so allow God to reign through his visionary messengers. All right, let me give you a couple of sub points under that. <laughs> that are giving, given to us through the example of Daniel. Number one, when God's a part of a message, the vision that it carries, this vision ministers to our burdens. So the vision that God reveals through his message, it ministers to our burdens. Go back to verse 1 of Daniel chapter 10. Daniel, <laughs> Daniel gives some context, backdrop to this vision that he receives. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. All right, now whether that's a separate narrator, because that's kind of in third person there, we now shift to first person, Daniel himself recounting. Verse 2, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-G, so here we see there's mourning, Three full weeks, I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. <coughs> so we see that the events of this chapter took place in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. If you understand history, already some of the captives have gone back to Jerusalem. 
That's key to make note of this evening because remember, Daniel is beginning to anticipate the 70 years are up, what's next, and God's going to reveal that to him. Some of that we covered last time. But Daniel's still stuck in Babylon. There's a, a tension in his soul as he uh, in, anticipates this transition uh, in the Babylonian exile. <coughs> in verse 3, Daniel describes what he was doing at the time of the vision for three weeks up to the moment he received it. He had been in mourning. Um, and so we see from these words that it was a period of mourning accompanied by prayer for understanding. He mentions that in verse 12 that we'll get to in just a moment. So he's, he's in a downturn emotionally, um, and God in that moment provides um, this vision. During this three-week period, he abstained from meat and wine, which is interesting because sometimes we get hung up on the substances that when, Paul per- or when Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat or wine, um, seems to indicate here that he was partaking in those substances in one sense, but something was different. And I would submit maybe the, that, that meat and wine being offered to idols, maybe some other things as we talked about in Daniel chapter 1, but at least for this three-week period, he is abstaining from meat and wine. He denies himself uh, access to um, the lotions of the day. Did you see that? He says, I didn't anoint myself. Um, <coughs> they did not have access to the bathing, the clean water that we have today, even in Babylon proper. And so to deal with not being gross, just the body odor, or thing, they would anoint themselves. It was a socially acceptable thing to do, and he abstains from that and isolates himself, uh, seeking for God's comfort and vision. <coughs> and so we see Daniel here, not in a comfortable place, but in a place of mourning. And into this mourning and into this sorrow, God reveals um, his vision. Um, I've been, I guess maybe because I know I'm going to have to live it if I preach it and teach it, been kind of playing, um, ducking and weaving with the principle or spiritual discipline of fasting. And it's something we're going to talk about next year, uh, if not before Um, In the little bit that I've taken a stab at fasting, I've realized how undisciplined I am and how much my earthly, not wrong, but just earthly appetites do uh, consume my attention. And I was reading an article the other day. The author said this, if you want to see how much power something has over you, try fasting from it. Um, You may think your phone doesn't control you, but just, just separate yourself from it for a few hours. Um, and watch how you even have physical withdrawal symptoms. It's, it's something we all are guilty of if we're not careful. And often immediate gratification mutes the voice of God in our lives. Daniel removed some things. He abstained from some things to hear from God as it related to the burden of his soul. And so <laughs> I just would say to you tonight, God's message through his word and spirit is not just a token sentiment for the joyous occasions of life. It is also for the down moments and seasons of life. Ones like Daniel navigated regularly as a, as a Babylonian captive. And the question tonight is, where are you closing off instead of opening up to the visionary comforts of the Lord? But listen, lead us forward to a place we can experience his comfort and grace. A lot of us, it is our nostalgia, it is our the good old days mindset that wants us to go back to find comfort. And I'm not saying that's always wrong. I'm just saying if that's all you do, God is trying to move you toward his comfort, which is in the future. Um, I love the First Thessalonians 4 passage, which I believe teaches <laughs> the rapture. And at the end of that, he says, wherefore do what with these words? Comfort one another. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4 is not about the good old days and them being restored. It's about the future. Um, and so Daniel here receives comfort from the Lord as we're about to get, through, uh, get to uh, through the revelation of God and the vision that it provided. So vision that ministers to our burdens. Number two, <coughs> jot this down, vision that overwhelms our senses. Um, and this is a hard aspect of our study tonight, that if we want to hear from God his message, he's going to reveal a vision to us that overwhelms us. Um, as I mentioned, Titus and Micah and I were out the other day talking about humor, and humor, we were talking, is very subjective, right? I remember being a youth pastor in Michigan. I would tell a joke in youth group, and it wouldn't land. People are like, what? That's not funny. 
and things they would say to me as Michiganders, I, I didn't think were funny. It, it's timing, it's regional, it's kind of case by case, how you were raised, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, dad jokes are always funny, just for the record, okay? And Stacy, I saw her shake her head no to kind of check Clay there, I'm sure. But um, somebody was talking about with humor, you know when you like, you're like with somebody that you, could, you feel like you can be yourself and you get like laughing like hard. Like I'm talking like, like you're both losing your dignity, okay, kind of laughter. And then, then you go to the next level where you start getting that like shrieky voice. You like add something that makes it even funnier. And then the other person, while they're like just splitting a gut, they add something. You know what I mean? And you're literally, you're like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to breathe for the next gut laughter that we're going to share together. You're overwhelmed with how funny it is, right? That's the idea with the vision of God. God's vision is not meant to be kind of stand back at a distance and coolly kind of analyze, oh, interesting, interesting, interesting. It's meant to overwhelm us, to humble us, and to put into context our big fears and worries and concerns against the backdrop of a much bigger God and plan that he is working. (laughs) And to say that Daniel is overwhelmed in Daniel 10 is probably an understatement. He is absolutely brought to his knees, to his face, um, overwhelmed with what God is revealing to him. And so we must be open to that if we truly want to have a godly vision. Um, (coughs) Somebody said this, Thomas Watson, recently I was reading, he said this, The reason we come away so cold from reading the word is because we do not warm ourselves, and I would add overwhelm ourselves, at the fire of meditation. Like at first blush, God's message may seem a bit underwhelming, but the more you think on it and meditate upon it, as Daniel strives to do here, it is perfectly natural and holy for us to be overwhelmed by it. All right, so look back at the verses that we began with. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 5. <laughs> he sees a certain man, and I'll give you my best guess on who this is in a moment, who is clothed in linen, likely indicating white garments, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. Um, and uh, just kind of these superlatives that he uses. His body was like the barrel, his face is the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, his arms and feet like the color of polished brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. So we see in verses (coughs) 5 and 6 this man who has human appearance, dressed like a priest likely, wearing a belt of gold. His physical description looks more like a statue um, than a moving being. His body is like chrysolite is the word there, that barrel word if you're familiar with your elements. His face like lightning, eyes like flaming torches, and the list goes on. And his voice booms like the sound of a multitude. So an overwhelming presence this person has uh, before Daniel. My guess would be this. I'll give you the different sides of it, but my conclusion, then I'll give you the reasoning for it, is this likely is Gabriel that is described here, um, (laughs) previously sent by God to reveal truth to Daniel in chapter 8 and verse 16. Um, And so it's possible that it is Gabriel. Some would teach that the man... Here is the pre-incarnate Christ because of similarities of description here that are found of Christ in Revelation 1. I will concede that, that that is possible. Um, Also, they would say that is true because the response of Daniel and his friends um, in Daniel chapter 10. So a similar response of Daniel and his friends in Daniel chapter 10. And then lastly, the fact that this, quote, man may be the son of man that's referenced in chapter 7 and verse 13. Um, and that here in uh, chapter 8 or chapter 10, uh, as well as what's referenced in chapter 7, this is the Son of Man. Now, here's the reason I am hesitant to land in that position. Um, the improbability that Christ would be hindered by a prince or a demon seems to be unlikely, and we'll get to that in a minute, that this one who comes to be a messenger to Daniel is hindered when Christ has all things under his feet, There's no one that can resist his power, um, and that seems to be unlikely that that would occur, um, and um, that he would need help from the angel Michael. That just seems to put Jesus underneath of 
versus um, over top of others. And so I would tend to guess at least this is an angel and likely Gabriel uh, because we later see Michael referenced. Does that make sense? So I don't know that for sure. I would humbly yield to the Lord if he reveals in heaven. Please don't come up to Matt as soon as we get to heaven and say, I, you were wrong on that, okay? I just told you I probably or could be wrong on that, but that's at least my best guess. All right, verse 7. There'll probably be something or two that you can wag your finger at me, but at least that one, okay? I've given you that caveat. All right, verse 7. <coughs> so here's, and this is interesting. So Daniel in verse 7, as we read, he sees the vision but the men that are with him saw it not, and they fall down quaking. Does that sound familiar to you? Who does that remind you of? Paul, right? Saul. On the road to Damascus, they see a light, they hear a noise, but they don't hear the specific message. So that might counter everything I just said, that just like Jesus approached Paul, um, that maybe this is him approaching Daniel as well. Um, but we see it's a very individual thing, this revelation of God to Daniel. <laughs> Daniel, um, after he hears and sees the message that they don't hear, he staggers and collapses. And I think where he says, I was in a deep sleep on my face. How many of you sleep on your face? It probably indicates he fainted. Like he passed out. He was overwhelmed by what he had heard. And we'll get to the specifics of that more um, in just a moment. But the point is this, the vision Daniel received that he willingly accepted was one that overwhelmed his senses. Now, you say, Pastor, why is it of value that we open up our ears and eyes and hearts to God's vision and message that is so overwhelming? Um, why is that a value? I, I answer that with an illustration. Why is it we love the beach so much? Now, I, I would never want to retire on the beach. I'm too, like, type A, like, just to sit around all day, every day. I would drive myself and everybody that knows me crazy. I've got to have something to do. But I do enjoy going to a lake or um, to the ocean, especially the ocean. <laughs> Why is that so drawing to us? And I think here's the thought that I had, besides the beauty of it, the noises that go with it, et cetera, is it makes your life and your problems feel smaller, right? It just, the immensity of it, or go to the Grand Canyon, or go wherever. There's something about being in awe of something bigger and overwhelming to us that just makes our problems feel smaller or puts them into context, I don't know, something to that effect. And that is equally true of the vision of God. What we do with God's word is we get nervous and like something must be wrong with me if I read something in his word and I'm almost like, what? This is unbelievable. I, I can't even understand it. Aren't you glad our God is big enough that we can't understand him? Like that's soothing in of itself. And that his word is not um, easy sometimes to, to digest and apply. And, um, and, and Daniel's going through those same emotions here in Daniel uh, chapter 10. So... A fresh vision of God on his terms, not ours, is not intended to leave us comfy and cozy, but instead reverent and in overwhelmed awe that makes other threats and risk pale in comparison. So we must rejoice in that experience, that feeling, when we read his, wor his word. And the question tonight is this, where are other worries and fears looming too large because you, are not willing to ex because you are only willing to accept a diminished view of God that you can be comfortable with or you can control. If you will let God be God in your life, everything else shrinks. And that big glaring thing on the horizon that drives you crazy and stresses you out, the shadow gets shorter and smaller. Um, and in its place rules and reigns a God who always sees the future, it longs to reveal it to us. Now, as you know, we went to uh, Daniel a few weeks ago since we last studied in this section. And I was just kind of on my, hopefully people didn't think I was, you know, checking the scores of a game. But I have on my phone, like a lot of stuff I quote, illustration. I'm always, I have an app on my phone. I'm just keeping track of things God touches my heart about or something that I think may, may be a help to those I counsel or teach or preach to. <laughs> so I was just kind of, little lines from the play of Daniel, um, <clears throat> and the statement that really resonated with me, um, Daniel has just been elevated to um, second or third in the kingdom, um, and uh, I guess second in the kingdom at the time under Nebuchadnezzar, and um, 
he asked the um, he asked the steward that was there, the one overseeing the eunuchs. He says to him, "What do I do? What do I now do in this position of influence?" And this is obviously not in scripture, but I think clearly in line with it. To which the steward replied to him, he said, lead like you always have by following your God. Lead like you always have by following your God. And if you've been to see the play, you remember that's a powerful moment in the the dramatic development of the plot. And can I just say to us this evening, that's still our call. That's still our mandate as the people of God. We just follow him. And to lead... By following him means we need a fresh vision from God. We need to be in his word. We need to let his spirit direct us. So allow God to reign through his visionary message. Um, (coughs) I was reading the other day, kind of a sidebar, of what is called in entrepreneur circles, the innovator's dilemma. And here's the definition of that term. Where people who invent something are usually the last ones to see beyond it. And I will tell you, as the pastor of this church since we have started, if I'm not careful, I can get stuck in who we've been and who we are and not see the future that God is leading us toward. I'm not even talking about in the next five years. I'm talking 300 years from now and letting that future shape how I do church and ministry and my discipleship and my evangelism even this evening. And so we need a fresh sense of vision that only comes through God's message. All right, number two. So allow God to reign <laughs> through visionary messengers. Number two, allow God to reign through strong. I love this part of our study tonight. Allow God to reign through strong messengers. Um, we live in a day where God's people <laughs> are very timid. Like we don't want to offend anybody. We're not as assertive as we should be. We're not um, leaning into things that God has clearly called us to do and be. And I am guilty of that as well. And somebody was talking about, have you ever been in a grocery store and you need to get, <laughs> get an item that's right where someone else is shopping? You know where I'm going with this? So what do you do? You like pretend to be looking at something a little ways away instead of just saying, excuse me, could I get what I need? And they're like, you know, price checking per ounce, you know, how's this compared to this? And you're over there like... Like, why don't you just, I would not be offended if I was checking the price per ounce. If you said, hey, do you mind if I grab? Like, we just, we've gotten so, we're not willing to just, to be bold, to be strong and assertive in what God has called us to be. And so through his word, he gives to us the source of that, that fights against our feebleness and our timidity. Um, And so in verse 9, we have now a shift from the fainting spell to verse 10 where God is going to encourage and strengthen Daniel to be able to receive the vision he's going to get in the next chapter. Um, In fact, if you look, I have them circled in my Bible. Verse 10, it says, And behold, a hand touched me. Verse 16, And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Verse 18, Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and strengthened me. So three times you have these kind of first aid or the angel coming and and strengthening Daniel to be able to to process and to absorb um, the vision and detail that God is to reveal to him. And we also must find our strength in God's word. Let me give you two things on this as we finish. Number one, God provides strength that encourages our hearts. And we see that in verses 10 through 14, that the strength (laughs) that God (laughs) gave to Daniel through the message encouraged his heart. Uh, verse 10, as we just read, he sets him up on his, his knees. So if you can visualize Daniel, he's flat on his face, and the first thing God does is get him up on all fours. I think he's still down on the ground, but he helps him at least to get off the ground and upon the palms of my hands. So he's, if you're on your knees and your palms, you're still on all fours, right? He's, he's going to slowly raise him from this sense of being overwhelmed and weak before the vision that is before him. And what's interesting in verse 11 is how God speaks to Daniel. I love these these couple of verses that are so tender. Verse 11, he said unto me, O Daniel, a man man greatly beloved, understand understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. Again, that seems to indicate ascending 
again, I think reaffirming this as an angel. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. And so here we see now Daniel is at least upright and able to see and to process what God is about to reveal to him. Uh, Now, here's the interesting part of this chapter. Look at verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. So that would be a reference back to verses uh, verses 1 through 3. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. There's so much there. We, so God hears the prayer of Daniel, and he immediately sends uh, a messenger. But notice this friction, why it had taken so long. <clears throat> but the prince of the kingdoms of Persia withstood me one and 20 days, 21 days. Below Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now am I come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many, <laughs> many days. So we see this messenger had been sent to Daniel three weeks earlier, on the very first day that Daniel began to pray and mourn and fast. But the prince of the kingdoms of Persia, a kingdom of Persia, had detained this messenger um, until Michael, one of the chief princes, had come to help him. This is the first reference to Michael the archangel in the Bible, is right here. Um, And so you see this resistance obviously was great as God's trying to answer this prayer. There are spiritual forces at work seeking to um, resist um, the answer to that prayer. And the word Michael here means who is like God. That's what his name means, who is like God. Um, And is mentioned a couple of times in Daniel here as well as 12.1. Also mentioned in Jude 9 in Revelation 12, 7, those four places, the only places we see Michael referenced. So in verse, four, <laughs> verse 14, we see that this message concerned what would befall thy people, the Jewish people. The content of this prophecy will be found in the next chapter of Daniel. Now, I wanted us to hone in on the greatly beloved. You saw that in verse 11. If you go down to verse 19, God also refers to Daniel as a man greatly beloved. Um, I have a friend of mine, Tim Christensen, who pastors in Michigan. He preached here, I think, back on our 10th anniversary. But he recently posted, he did a wedding this summer. He's on the left, and then the guy, the groom is beside him, and the groom is just like, like ugly cry, okay, as his wife-to-be is walking down the aisle. He's just, and I'll admit, I, I, Heidi would tell you, I probably ugly cried when she came down the aisle. There's something about seeing someone walk towards you who knows you, at least somewhat, you get to know each other better as the years go by, who chooses to set their affection and love on you, right? And I think if we're not careful, we, we do not realize that in that is great strength, in that is great power, that we are loved of God. Think about this. God in this chapter is an all-out war, and yet he cares about his child. He cares about Daniel, how he's feeling, how he's overwhelmed, and he wants him to know, I love you. Um, And so this message that God gives us strengthens us with the love and the attention of God that is directed toward us. There is a spiritual war going on, that we know very little about, and we, hear, we see here just a small glimpse of it, where are we are letting our emotions frame what we see and don't see, which leads to impatience, doubts, discouragement, and numbness, instead of realizing God has got this. He cares for us, he's taking care of it, um, and we can trust him with the future. Lastly, let's spend a moment here, strength that fights our battles. And this is my favorite part of our study tonight, strength that fights our, <laughs> our battles. Um, <coughs> I can't remember the circumstances. It kind of took me back to like COVID when all the sports got shut down and some of us guys realize how much sports is a part of our therapeutic rhythms. Um, and you're watching like, you know, cherry, uh, cherry seed spitting contest in Michigan. I remember us watching that during COVID. Anyway, a few weeks ago, my son, I think this is when Ian was back, so it must have been this summer, um, and they were watching. I honestly cannot, even as I tell you this, I can't believe this is a thing. Car jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu. Have you heard of this? So two guys, sweaty guys. You ladies, this is gross even to think about, I know. 
they get in a car and they wrestle in the car. Like there's video cameras all around the car. I'm not kidding. This is a thing. Look it up. And, and they, afterwards, they interview whoever wins. It's hilarious. The whole thing is just crazy. But what was fun about it was not watching it. It was watching my wife watch it. <laughs> and at first, I think she thought we were, like, messing with her, like we had found, like, some video and put it on the screen and pretended it was live. I'm like, no, dear, look, ESPN, it's in the corner. This is a real thing. And my sons are nodding their head, and she's like, no. And then when it clicked, she's like, you got to be kidding me. There is no way this is a thing. I don't know if you train for it. Like, how do you practice to, to do jujitsu in a car? Anyway, it was a crazy thing. My point in using that illustration besides to wake you up is this. Sometimes our view of the battle that's going on is very myopic. It's very small. God is fighting a battle, listen, that is much bigger than Wayne County. It's much bigger than the good old USA. He's fighting in other dimensions. He's fighting in the spiritual realm on fronts that we should be appreciative of and yet cannot fully understand or see. And this God that, that we serve is faithful to defend us on all of, the, all of these fronts. So in verses 15 to 17, he's overwhelmed to learn of this conflict. Again, he's on his face toward the ground and he can't speak, is what verse 15 says. One from the angelic realm, whether it's the same one referenced earlier or another, touches his lips, his mouth is open, he's able now to speak again, and he says unto the Lord, O my Lord, by the vision my stars are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remains no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. So he's asking God for strength to understand about this tension and battle going on in the spiritual realm. In verses 18, the angel touches him um, and strengthens him. Again, calls him greatly beloved. Notice, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he spoke unto me, I was strengthened. Like, can you say that? When God spoke to me, I was strengthened. That should be a regular rhythm in your life. And Daniel here experiences that. Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. And so God strengthens Daniel through his message. All right, verse 20. Then said he, Know thou whereof I come unto thee, and now I return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone, forth lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. And so basically the angel says, I got tied up in battle, and when I leave you, I'm going right back into the fray. Um, This battle that just keeps going and going, a reference to um, probably demonic forces connected to human governments and powers such as Persia and Greece here. Um, Persia will be mentioned in chapter 11, verses 2 to 4. Greece will be mentioned from verse 5 to 35. These two powers of the day um, and the spiritual forces at work in them. I just remind you of this tonight as we go into an election cycle. Ultimately, our enemy is not a political party or persona, right? Ephesians 6 reminds us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Behind it all are spiritual forces. And what that does, for me at least, and I think should do for all of us, is remind me and you, we need God to fight for us. Um, He may use us as a part of it, but we're never going to win the war because we don't even know who we're fighting. We can't even see them. We can't even deal with their ploys and their agendas without God's discernment and help. And so here the fight goes on and on, and God says he will take responsibility to continue to defend us. All right, last verse, verse 21. But I will show thee which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. And so here the angel gives this final word before the specifics of the vision, that all of this is a part of the future history God is shaping that, listen, has already been written. Did you see that in verse 21? I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. It's already, the ending has already been written. And so we must turn to God to allow him to give to us this message that he alone can reveal. The purpose of the message is not to tell us how we can win our own battles. 
The purpose of the message is to remind us that God and his angels will win the victory and that we are to live in the present tense in light of that victory. Um, Heard a guy say this the other day, God only gives the devil enough rope to hang himself. And that's all that's happening right now. He's not got any extra leash. He's not getting away with nothing. Um, he is and only has always had enough rope to ultimately hang himself. Trust that God has written the end of the story and live in light of it because it's built on the message of God's word. All right, last picture I'll show you. I have a friend of mine who was in um, Paris at the Louvre, and they have all kinds of works of art and you know things from all of human history. And <laughs> as you see there, he says, this is my favorite piece in the Louvre. It dates back to the Persian Empire in Darius about circa 510. So Daniel probably died in the 30s, like 530-ish, 535, um, after the time of Daniel, but would have likely been visible during the reign of Queen Esther. And this is a, an edifice just kind of projecting the power and the strength of the Persian Empire. That still exists on planet Earth. Isn't that kind of cool to think about that? That goes back almost to Daniel's time. And yet, the kingdom and all of its culture and all of its power is gone. This is all that remains, propping up shadows of past empires. And yet, our God that we have access to in his message reminds us that his future is secure, that he is in control. And someday, you and I, haven't said this, I think, to this point, will be able to share in all that God has promised with Daniel. Like, that's amazing. I was thinking about that when we were in Lancaster a few weeks ago, just thinking about that. That's not just a character. That's a real guy. Um, and someday we'll be able to compare notes and contrast things that God revealed to us in our respective ages of, of God's working with his people. This <laughs> last thought, and we'll finish. One commentator said this in relation to Daniel 10. We must not <laughs> forget the central teaching of Daniel 10, the amazing truth that God's people are not in the conflict, here's the key word, alone. We are not in the conflict between good and evil alone. The Bible as a whole calls us to the life of a warrior in a world of conflict, but God does not send us out to fight on our own or even to pool our resources with other Christians. No, he sent his son to win the first battle. He defeated evil by dying on the cross. He gives us confidence to face the abuse and wrong of today because, quote, our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us when he has come to rescue us for the last time, Romans 8, 13. So that's, that's the message. And my question to you tonight is this, why is it then that this does not shape our emotions and thoughts as much as the messaging of the world? I'm so tired of the theatrics and the hyperbole and the exaggeration that moves my heart and mind from confidence, steady, quiet confidence in who God is and what he's promised in the future. And what the next generation needs to see in us is a return to that message. We're salt and light, yes, brethren. We don't give ground without a fight. But ultimately, this is where we anchor our emotions and our thoughts. And I think the takeaway from Daniel 10 is this, whose messengers or messages are filling your ears? And there's only two options. They're either demonically fueled messages and messengers, or they are angelic. They're either from God or from the only other option, which is the devil himself. There is no third option. There's no neutral verse in Daniel 10. And there's no neutral moment corner crevice on the planet tonight. We must choose who we are going to listen to. So here's the question, and we'll pray. We allow God to rule in this present world by simply locking in through his spirit and word upon his visionary and his strong messages. Let's pray together.